Hello and welcome to this online guided tour at the Dachau concentration camp memorial. My name is Rafaela Merlini, Luisa Ferrero is uh, doing the filming for us today and uh, Erika Schreiber is um, supporting us at the computer. Today uh, we're going to talk about a um, relatively small group that was persecuted by the Nazis, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Please feel free to ask any question at any time. You can type in your question in the chat and either Luisa will read it out to me or Rike will uh, uh, answer directly in the chat. The uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are a um, Christian denomination uh, that originated uh, in the USA, in Pennsylvania, in 1870. Um, until 1930, uh, they were known as uh, the Bible Students uh, or International Bible Student Association. Then in 1930, they changed their name to Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, but the Nazis authorities will go on uh, calling them uh, Bi uh, Bibelforscher, Bible Students. Uh, they were um, heavily persecuted uh, by the Nazis. In fact, uh, 10,000 members, about half the number of its members in Germany at the time, were imprisoned during the dictatorship, including 2,000 uh, who were sent to concentration camps. Uh, 1,200 will not survive uh, the detention. And uh, here in Dachau, there were 600 prisoners who were um, here uh, as Jehovah's Witnesses, and about 100 of them died here. Uh, they were um, a very small group, uh, only 0.4% of the German population of the time, and uh, declared themselves uh, politically neutral, uh, but uh, still they were um, seen with great hostility uh, by um, red uh, right-wing uh, parties even before the Nazi dictatorship. Um, because they had uh, a more international outlook and had special ties with, with the United States. Uh, they had a very uh, strong uh, anti-war stand uh, and uh, also uh, the, they were uh, um, seen as maybe having links with Marxism uh, or the um, Jewish religion, so they were um, seen uh, with hostility and uh, Bavaria was a very right wing even before the Nazis uh, went to power. Uh, in fact it is not by chance that the uh, Nazi party was founded in Munich and um, uh, in fact, the judiciary and the administration were dominated by right-wing forces. So, um, already 1931, two years before uh, Hitler went to power, uh, here in Bavaria, the publication of the Jehovah's Witnesses were banned. Uh, here we are on what used to be the roll call square of the concentration camp. Uh, on this square, prisoners had to stand to attention every day, at least twice a day, morning and evening. You also see uh, two reconstructed barracks that give us an idea of what the barracks of the last uh, phase of the camp looked like. In fact, initially there were um, 10 barracks between 1933 and 1938, 10 stone barracks. Then in 1937-1938, the uh, SS wanted to enlarge the camp, so they pulled down uh, uh, the 10 barracks and constructed 10 wooden barracks, uh, sorry, 34 <laughs> uh, wooden barracks. Uh, whereas at the same time, when this camp was enlarged, uh, they also had this big building built and it had the kitchen, uh, the uh, registration room, shower room, boiler room and many workshops. Uh, now uh, this building houses the museum and uh, the offices of the uh, memorial. We can now go inside the museum, so I'll put on my face mask. Here uh, we have the first room of the museum uh, where there's an exhibition which is presented chronologically. 
Uh, these two rooms at the time of the concentration camp were workshops where prisoners had to do, uh, perform slave labor. Uh, so uh, this first room of the exhibition uh, focuses on the rise of the Nazi party. In fact, the Nazi party, as we said, was founded in Munich, but was initially very, very small, one of the many fringe parties that existed uh, during the um, Weimar Republic, the democratic phase uh, between the two world wars here in Germany. And, uh, but then, uh, after 1929, after the Wall Street crash in uh, the United States, uh, the economic crisis uh, was uh, dreadful everywhere, but particularly here in Germany, and the Nazis were therefore able to gain more votes. And you can see here, this is the Nazi party, initially very little support, and then in November 1932, uh, they will... Uh, managed to gain 33% of the votes and therefore be able to form a coalition government with another nationalist party. Hitler will be appointed chancellor on the 30th of January 1933 and just a few weeks later, uh, in the night of the 27th of uh, February, uh, the German parliament is burnt down in Berlin and a young, young Dutch boy is uh, found uh, on the premises and uh, uh, confesses to having uh, set fire to the parliament. And uh, there, are no, there is no evidence of him having anybody help him, but the Nazis will present the fire as an act of terrorism planned and organized by the communist. And so they will issue what they call uh, um, they will issue an emer emergency decree that they call for the protection of the state and of the people. And according to this uh, emergency decree, the fundamental rights granted by the Constitution of Weimar are abolished. In fact, it specifically says that these articles of the um, uh, Constitution are suspended until further notice. It is therefore authorized to restrict the rights of personal freedom, freedom of expression, including the freedom of the press, the freedom of to organize and assemble, the privacy of post, telegraph, and telephone communications, warrants for house searches, orders for confiscation, as well as restrictions on property are also authorized. So, um, uh, with these uh, limits to the fundamental freedoms, Anybody uh, can be arrested at any time, and uh, anybody who's not in line with the regime can be arrested, but there are many, so prisons become overcrowded rather quickly. So the SS, the Nazis open, uh, set up uh, concentration camps. These are all the concentration camps operating in Germany uh, between the years of 1933 and 1935. This is what Germany looked like at the time. Obviously, it is not anymore. And you can see that Dachau is one of the first to be set up in 1933. In fact, we can have a look at this article uh, published on a local newspaper uh, on the 21st of March 1933. Everything is happening very quickly. And it reports that the day before, Heinrich Himmler, who was head of the Bavarian police and of the SS, he uh, had announced in a press conference that there was going to be a concentration camp here in Dachau. So it was not a secret that there were concentration camps in Germany at the time, also from abroad. It was a well-known fact that there were concentration camps in Germany, but of course, um, in this article, it's presented as something positive. Uh, a necessary tool uh, to protect Germany against uh, terrorism. And the people who are brought here, um, potential terrorists, uh, troublemakers, mainly communists, and uh, they'll be brought here and re-educated. So uh, this degree was aimed mainly at getting rid of all the political opposition, but it uh, also uh, had effects on uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, although they maintained their political neutrality, uh, but um, uh, they had also to suffer uh, limitations in their um, freedom of expression, and 
already by June 1933, uh, the uh, activities and publications of the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are banned in many German states, including Bavaria. And um, in fact, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses annoyed uh, the Nazis because they uh, refused to uh, perform the Hitler salute, the, uh, uh, the fascist uh, salute that the uh, Nazis called the German salute, and they would also um, refuse to swear loyalty to uh, the state and the regime, and they would not bear arms. Um, in fact, uh, already um, uh, in uh, July 1933, uh, it became compulsory for civil ser servants to perform the uh, Nazi salute, and Jehovah's Witnesses who did not comply would be dismissed. As from August 1934, it became compulsory to swear loyalty to the uh, state and the regime, and teachers had to uh, sign a declaration uh, saying that they were not Jehovah's Witnesses, otherwise they'd lose their job. Jehovah's Witnesses were also dismissed in the private sector, uh, and authorities could confiscate uh, cars and bicycles, they could withdraw driver's license uh, and uh, pensions, and also evict uh, families from their homes. Uh, Children also suffered under the Nazi uh, dictatorship because uh, uh, children who did not perform the um, uh, um, Hitler salute would uh, be laughed at, also if they didn't uh, sing patriotic songs, and um, also uh, um, this was seen sometimes as a, a reason enough to expel children. So many children were, um, from uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness families were expelled already in 1933. And uh, some children were even taken away from their families and put into orphanages or given to foster families so that they would be um, brought up as so-called good Germans. And uh, in fact, by 1945, 860 children will have been taken away from their parents. In, by um, 1934, uh, uh, the activities of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are uh, banned uh, in the whole of Germany, and uh, in fact, uh, nine members are arrested uh, and sentenced to two years and a half for defying this ban. And uh, then in 1935, the uh, compulsory military service is introduced in Germany once again and um, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, mostly would not enroll, uh, but uh, this meant facing a uh, sentence in jail. And as from 1939, uh, the um, penalty for not joining the army uh, will be uh, the capital punishment. In fact, during the war, 250 Jehovah's Witnesses were executed for refusing to uh, be soldiers. Uh, in 1936, uh, June 1936, there was a, a big uh, wave of mass arrests of Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, in fact, 17 members uh, were uh, actually died uh, during interrogations in the first 10 months of this uh, wave of arrests. And among them, there was also Heinrich Lutherbach, who was uh, who played uh, the violin in a small orchestra, 27 year old at the time. And uh, he uh, uh, was uh, sentenced uh, to 10 months uh, jail. But in April uh, 1937, the Gestapo issued an order according to which all the members of the International Bible Students Association who have re been released from prison after serving their sentence are to be taken into protective custody and transferred to a concentration camp. Protective custody was a term used by the Nazis to camouflage unlimited extrajudicial uh, detention. Um, we can now go to the next room, which uh, was actually the registration room.
so uh, prisoners who had just been brought to the camp would have to come in from this door and then line up on this side sorry <laughs> on this side of the room they had to take off all their clothes and give in all um, their possessions uh, also at the time the room would be divided in two only that instead of these metal tables that you see now there used to be wooden desks like uh, that one over there I don't know if you can see it if Louisa is able to film it and uh, behind the wooden desk there would be prisoners who had the job of taking down the names of those who just arrived and also uh, fill in forms for each one of them. There was a form where it would be listed uh, all the personal uh, possessions that the prisoner had, all the items of clothing that he had when he arrived. And there would also be a prisoner personal card. And uh, it looked something like this. Um, Heftling is the German word for prisoner. And this is the prisoner card of uh, Franz Desch. Um, here is his physical description and uh, his date of birth is um, in uh, 1918. So he was just uh, a few weeks short of his uh, 20th birthday when he was brought here in 1938. And uh, there's also his address and there's uh, his religion which is uh, indicated here as B-I-F-O, which uh, was short for Bibelforscher, Bible student. And if we looked uh, at the reason of his arrest, we see the same word. He was brought here because of his religion, because he was a Jehovah's Witness. We also have his um, prisoner's number, because as soon as a person was brought here, to the concentration camp and was registered, he was no longer called by his name, but just by his number. People were not tattooed here in uh, Dachau. Uh, in general, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses in the concentration camp had a reputation of being very trustworthy. And in fact, uh, Rudolf Huss, who uh, was an SS who started his career here at the Dachau concentration camp and then will become commandant of the extermination camp of Auschwitz, where he oversaw the gassing of millions of men, women and children. Uh, after the end of the war, uh, he will be um, under, imprisoned by the British and uh, during his imprisonment, he will write uh, his memoirs and uh, he also um, mentions Jehovah's Witnesses, and this is what he says. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were hardworking and reliable. They could be sent out on work details without guards since they wanted to suffer imprisonment for Jehovah. The problem was that they stubbornly refused to have anything to do with the military or the war. It is true that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, even in concentration camp, would refuse to have anything to do with war or uh, war production. They refused to work in any factory where um, um, war production was taking place. Of course, instead, the idea of them wanting to suffer for Jehovah's was absolutely absurd, uh, but is, uh, they did have a reputation of um, not trying to escape. And uh, some people uh, describe this as a sort of fatalism, as wanting to accept their fate. Uh, but um, um, my colleague uh, Guido Hassel, who is our expert for Jehovah's Witnesses here in, uh, at the memorial, he explained that uh, fatalism is not mentioned in their literature at all and that the reason why Jehovah's Witnesses would not try and escape is because they were aware that the, whenever a prisoner uh, escaped or tried to escape, the SS would uh, retaliate on other prisoners as well. And therefore, they preferred to endure their own suffering rather uh, than being indirect cause of uh, suffering to others. 
Um, but in general, they were often used as uh, servants by the SS and uh, sent to work details where, uh, they, uh, did, where it was difficult to guard them, uh, hoping that they would not escape. And uh, uh, Hans Loritz, who became commandant here in Dachau uh, in 1938, will make great use of Jehovah's Witnesses for the building and the running of his holiday villa on an la uh, Austrian lake, the Wolfgang Lake. And uh, in fact, um, Heinrich Lutherbach, whom we mentioned earlier, uh, was one of the first to be sent uh, to Wolfgang's Lake to start the building of uh, his villa, of Loritz's villa. And um, in fact, it was quite common for SS commandants or SS officers to uh, have no scruples in making use of prisoners or prisoners' work or even uh, uh, prisoners' food during the war, war um, for their own personal advantage. That did happen quite uh, often. We can now uh, go on uh, through the museum and um, see the next room. The SS divided prisoners in different groups and treated the groups differently uh, as a way of trying to undermine solidarity among prisoners because treating the groups uh, differently, they hoped to create hostility, envy among the groups. And uh, uh, prisoners uh, had to sew their number on uh, their uniform and also the symbol of the group they'd been assigned to. This is a table done by the SS for their own internal use with all the various symbols that we used here in Dachau. The red triangle was for political prisoners, green was for uh, criminals, uh, blue for emigrants. Emigrants were um, Germans who had tried to emigrate to go somewhere and live somewhere else. Uh, but uh, had been sent back by the country they'd fled to, and so we were brought here to concentration camps. Um, purple was for Jehovah's Witnesses. You can see there, Bibel Forscher, Bible student. Uh, pink was for homosexuals, and uh, black was uh, for a group called A Social that included homeless, uh, unemployed, and Sinti and Roma. The stripe above the triangle meant that the person had uh, been released and then brought to the concentration camp a second time, and therefore, as a second timer, would have harsher conditions. Harsher conditions were also given to the person who had a black dot, because that was a sign of a punishment unit, whereas if a prisoner was Jewish, he had to add another triangle to form the Star of David. Uh, as from 1939, uh, as a, uh, with the outbreak of the Second World War, thousands of, of prisoners will be brought uh, to the camp from the invaded territories, and all the prisoners who were not German uh, were automatically considered political prisoners and had the red triangle and had to put the um, initial of their country inside the triangle. So uh, non-German Jehovah's Witnesses would be classified as uh, political prisoners normally. This labeling system had also the um, aim of humiliating uh, prisoners, but in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, for them to see another purple triangle was actually a source of comfort, of encouragement, and even if they could not talk to each other, they, um, just by exchanging a look, they would give each, other, give each other moral support and encouragement. As from uh, December 1937, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses will differ from other prisoners in the concentration camp because they can be released at any time uh, the moment they sign a declaration in which they renounced their religion. But in, throughout the concentration camps, only 10% of Jehovah's Witnesses will avail themselves of this possibility. This infuriated the uh, Nazis. They uh, defined this as fanatism. 
And so they punished uh, Jehovah's Witnesses with a mail ban. For 10 months, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses were, are not allowed to receive or send any mail at all. Then the mail ban was um, changed into a mail restriction, and so they could uh, have one letter a month. The normal rule was two a month. And uh, on the correspondence of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, there would be a stamp that um, said, uh, the prisoner remains, as before, a stubborn Bible student and refuses to reject the Bible student's false teachings. For this reason, the usual privileges of correspondence have been denied to him. It is interesting that the SS refer, refer to um, receiving letters from loved ones as a privilege rather than a basic right, um, but um, for many uh, prisoners, having news of their loved ones uh, was actually an essential element uh, of survival and BSS were very well aware of it and so deliberately used mail bans as a way of uh, punishing uh, prisoners. Here uh, we see uh, a person who his name is Hans Gärtner. He was born in uh, 1906, uh, 1906 uh, the eldest of, of five siblings. Here uh, we see a photo of him with his four sisters. Uh, one of them, uh, Apollonia Ludwig, uh, will um, describe her brother as uh, a person um, with a great sense of humor and a zest for life. Uh, in, uh, he trained uh, to become a barber. In fact, we see here a, sh a photograph of him in his barber shop. He was very successful in his profession. And um, in uh, 1930, he will become a Jehovah's Witness. And in 1933, he will marry uh, Dorothea Schuch. Uh, Dorothea Schuch was not a uh, Jehovah's Witness herself. Um, but the two of them will have to suffer from the Nazi dictatorship from the very start. In fact, uh, already in November 1933, uh, their house will be searched and all uh, the religious literature will be uh, confiscated. Uh, Hans Gärtner will be arrested for the first time in April 1935. And uh, one of the Nazi lead, local, local Nazi leaders uh, will write in his report. For some time now, Gertner's barber shop has served as a hideout for enemies of the state and of the national racial community. Closing this shop is urgently required in the interest of the party and of the state, so that this hotbed of Marxism finally disappears. Um, Hans Gärtner was then released, but uh, arrested uh, again two times in the next uh, two years. Um, in the meantime, uh, him and his wife had had two children, Lisa uh, and Johannes. Johannes Gärtner will never get to know his father, but uh, he uh, remembered his mother often talking about uh, how consequent Hans Gärtner was in um, refusing to do the uh, Nazi salute, uh, even when his wife and his mother-in-law tried to convince him uh, to conform just for peace sake, but he would always answer, I will not be a hypocrite before the Lord. In early 1937, uh, he was released uh, from his uh, second uh, detention and he went to visit his uh, sister Apollonia and told her about the premonition he had about the suffering that was ahead of him and um, said to her, I know what I'm dying for, the others don't. He will be uh, arrested again in June 1937, brought here to the Dachau concentration camp. <clears throat> then in September 1939, he will be transferred uh, to uh, the concentration camp of Mauthausen. He will be transferred back to Dachau in April 1940. And by this time, he weighed only 40 kilos. He was in a dreadful state of undernourishment, 
uh, and um, very weak, desperate, and he begs uh, an SS for some food. And the SS man, instead of giving him a piece of bread, will cut off one of his fingers. And um, Hans Gerner will die uh, a few weeks later at the age of 33. Uh, we can now uh, go out of the museum. The Americans uh, liberated uh, the uh, Dachau concentration camp on the 29th of April 1945. They used uh, the area after it was liberated as a detention area for Nazi criminals. Here in this building there were many uh, trials against Nazi criminals and that's why the, the building was used for other purposes and it had been altered a bit. Then in 1948, the Americans gave the area back to the Bavarian uh, authorities who then transfer, transformed part of what used to be the concentration camp in a refugee camp where the refugees were German-speaking minorities from Poland and Czechoslovakia who were no longer, no longer welcome in these areas, so they had to abandon what they had and come to live in Germany, but had nowhere to go to, so the authorities set up a refugee camp for them. Um, but this area here was not used as part of a refugee camp. It, was, uh, it has remained more or less as it was. And uh, this uh, building that you see on your left is um, uh, the uh, museum from the, uh, the main building from the, uh, from the back, uh, whereas this other building is called Bunker. I mean, that was the nickname it had uh, during the Nazi time. And uh, it is a prison within a prison. In uh, this courtyard, um, some of the punishments took place. And uh, one of them was the so-called Baum, which is the German word for tree. Uh, in English, you could call it, uh, unfortunately, uh, pole hanging. And uh, this meant that the person who had to be punished in this way would have to stand on a, t uh, on a stool, um, put his hands behind his back, his wrist would be tied and then fixed to a hook on a pole, and then the SS would take the stool away and the person would be left hanging by his wrists. Uh, this is a drawing done by a survivor. And uh, you can see how dreadful the person was hanging by his wrist uh, above the ground. And uh, this was incredibly painful uh, and uh, would normally last an hour. And uh, prisoners often had permanent damage in their shoulders or wrists or both. Martin Pötzinger, who uh, became a um, Jehovah's uh, Witness when he was 24, uh, was uh, arrested in July 1938 and uh, brought here to Dachau, and his first impression of the concentration camp was that of a madhouse. Uh, he was punished with the pole, and um, he uh, uh, remembers that the pain was unbearable, so in order to uh, survive and withstand the, the, the suffering, he started praying sil silently. But uh, because he was not screaming like the other prisoners, the SS uh, were uh, very angry and started kicking him so that uh, he could, would suffer even more. Uh, Martin uh, Pötzinger was then Trans ah, too much light, right? Uh, sorry. Um, or maybe if I go on the other side is better. Um, is this better? Mm. Or not? Yeah, or should we? <laughs> no, okay, we'll go inside. Um, this uh, building, uh, uh, as we said, has remained more or less untouched. It was a prison within a prison. Uh, prisoners would be locked up in here either as a form of punishment or um, for interrogation purposes or because uh, the SS wanted to keep certain prisoners separate from the others for specific reasons. 
Now, uh, you probably will have noticed that uh, we again have visitors at the memorial. It's again open uh, to the public, finally, after the long lockdown. Uh, but these, this building, together with the uh, reconstructed barrack, unfortunately cannot be uh, accessible to visitors because of the anti-COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, and so uh, we will be able to go inside, but that's why it looks not very accessible right now. So, uh, going back to uh, Martin Pötzinger, he was then transfer transferred in uh, September 1939 uh, to the concentration camp of Mauthausen, together with Hans Gerdner, whom we mentioned earlier, and also um, another 142 Jehovah's Witnesses. He uh, will remain in Mauthausen until uh, he will be liberated by the Americans on uh, the 2nd of May 1945. Here we see him together with his wife Gertrude, who uh, was also a Jehovah's Witness and was um, uh, also arrested and uh, deported to the concentration camp of Ravensbrück, which was mainly for women. There uh, she uh, had the job of looking after um, the children of an SS officer, so she managed to survive. And uh, after liberation, she will walk from Ravensbrück, which is in the north of Germany, all the way back to Munich, which is in the south of Germany. Um, this building, as we said, was called Bunker, and uh, we will we are planning to have a guided tour specifically on this building. Um, but as you can see, it was uh, a corridor with many cells, 130 uh, in total. And uh, there are cells on each side. Normally, uh, prisoners would be locked up in solitary confinement. And uh, the uh, guards uh, could, uh, sometimes it would be in total darkness because the guards could decide from the outside uh, um, by turning the tap on and off uh, if uh, they could have the heating on or, or not, whether they could have light or not, because again, differentiating treatment was a way of uh, breaking down solidarity and making one prisoner uh, hostile to another prisoner. Paul uh, Vauer uh, was arrested, uh, was a Jehovah's Witness, and arrested in 1937. He uh, was uh, sentenced uh, to, um, uh, uh, to uh, 10 months, uh, uh, but then he was sent uh, to, so he spent 10 months in, in jail, and then he was sent to uh, the concentration camp of Sachsenhausen, and then from there, he, in uh, May 1941, he will be sent to uh, the Wolfgang See in Austria, again to uh, work on uh, um, the uh, villa of uh, Hans Loritz. Uh, and there he had the job of uh, cooking, and uh, uh, he was a cook and the barber, both for uh, prisoners and the SS. In fact, the SS would uh, let the... Uh, I can actually take the mask down here, out here, because uh, there are no visitors here. And um, they, uh, he, he, they uh, would let themselves uh, be shaved by uh, Jehovah's Witnesses because they knew that they would not cut their throat as other prisoners.
probably would. Um, he uh, then, in August 1941, he was transferred to Dachau, and he worked in this building as a so-called Karl Factor, which means that he was responsible for food, uh, of, of, for feeding the prisoners, and also um, for providing food for the prisoners, and also the upkeeping of the whole building. And uh, he used uh, his job as uh, uh, trying to, you know, in a way, to, as to try and help uh, prisoners as much as he could. In fact, he would often smuggle water or food or um, pieces of bread uh, and uh, to the prisoners and also um, often uh, during the night he would uh, switch the heating on while the SS were sleeping so again as to pro provide some kind of relief to the prisoners who were suffering very much in this building. Uh, on the 24th of April 1945, he will be transferred together with another 140 uh, so-called special prisoners to the north of Italy, South Tyrol. Uh, this was a, a group of special prisoners because they were high-profiled, uh, German but also international. There were two secret a a British secret agents among them. There was uh, the ex-French uh, Prime Minister Leon Blum together with his wife and the ex-Chancellor of Austria Schuschnigg with his wife and daughter and uh, many others. And uh, because they were high-profiled, the um, uh, Heinrich Himmler, who was head of the SS, um, thought that he could try and use them as a negotiation pawn with the Allies, hoping to exchange them as hostages. And that's why when uh, the Americans got very close to the concentration camp of Dachau, he got all this group out and uh, had them transported to the north of Italy, where they will be liberated by the Americans on the 5th of May, 1945. And uh, um, Paul Bauer, will be able to be reunited with his daughter after nine years of detention. We can now go along the corridor of this um, building, the bunker.
The last thing uh, that I wanted to show you um, in this online guided tour is a plaque that is, uh, has been placed in the commemorative room. This is a room which is in the main building at the end of the um, exhibition, of the main exhibition. And here, uh, there are, uh, uh, the purpose of this room is to uh, remember individuals or groups of prisoners. And uh, this uh, plaque was placed here by Alexander Epstein. Uh, he was a Holocaust survivor, uh, a German Jew who had survived the concentration camps of Flossenburg, Sachsenhausen and uh, Auschwitz. And during his detention, he had uh, met uh, some fellow prisoners who were Jehovah's Witnesses, who helped him and gave him moral support. And uh, uh, they uh, talked about their faith and he began to share their beliefs and uh, in fact in August 1945 he will uh, become a, a Jehovah's Witness himself and he decided to place this plaque in memory of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, here in Dachau as a sign of um, respect and gratitude. And uh, I believe this is a very beautiful and powerful uh, sign of solidarity among the victims of the uh, um, Nazi dictatorship. Are there any questions? No? Then I thank you very much for your attention and bye-bye. See you next time.